back in 1996, uh, I built small electrolyzers, which eventually became the ER50, by the way. But they were made out of transparent PVC plastic, so I could actually look inside and see what was happening. And I discovered something that I had never seen before. In all the physics courses that I'd taken, all the books that I had read, I saw something that had never been described before in any electrolysis. I saw a line of gas coming up right in the middle of the cell. I saw hydrogen coming off the cathode, I saw oxygen coming off the anode, and I saw a line of gas coming right out of the fluid itself. I did not know what that was, but it was there. And as an inventor, I, I'm not like a scientist. That's, I, yeah, that's normal for a simple electrolyzer design, is it not? No, no, absolutely. No. The, okay. the hydrogen and the oxygen is normal, but this this uh, bubbles that are mm -hmm. coming out of the fluid. Now, of course, in in normal electrolyzers, the solution gets full of bubbles really fast. So it, it seems like there's bubbles coming right out of the solution because the hydrogen and oxygen infuse into the uh, fluid, and so there's hydrogen and oxygen bubbles in there. But what I'm talking about is when you first start it up, and there's no hydrogen and oxygen bubbles in the solution itself. Bubbles were being formed in the center of the electrolyzer that were not attached or formed by either electrode. It was coming right out of the solution. So this was absolutely unique. Now, there's been other people that have uh, developed Browns gas machines with, uh, with this design before me, so it wasn't unique to me, but it was unique to my experience. It was the first time I'd seen it, and it's the first time anyone has reported it, as far as I know, so back in 1996. All right, so I, I started to, and this is one of the things about an inventor and in, in inventing, once in a while you see something and then it, it becomes a passion and, you, uh, and you're able to do more things with it. Okay, so it turns out that what this is, it, it, the, the most workable theory hypothesis at, at the moment and it's been uh, um, being tested like with the University of Washington and a lot of other places as well, is that this is a plasma form of water. So my electrolyzers, you remember I was saying they were twice as efficient as the uh, Browns gas ones that you could buy kind of thing? One of the reasons was right. I had optimized it for making this particular gas, which we call electrically expanded water. So it's a plasma form of electron rich plasma form of water. So it's negatively charged plasma. It's actually water. See, my electrolyzers were actually making gas 130% efficient, which means there was 30% more gas than theoretically possible by the Faraday equations, which had been, I don't know, 150 years at that time, Faraday had invented them, and no one had ever had an electrolyzer get over 100% efficient. So there was a there was a gas that was happening in that electrolyzer. It, it wasn't over 100% efficient, by the way. What was happening is, is electrically expanded water is another gas that's a side effect of the electrolysis and that isn't part of the Faraday equations. So okay, as yeah, the, it's uh, an additional gas that's not hydrogen or oxygen and it's contributing to the volume and the pressure. Exactly. You got it. Okay. okay. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm Network uh, currently under construction, uh, just visit the website, uh, pasnia.com, P-A-Z-N-I-A.com uh, is the website for all the information there. Uh, today, I come to, come to you with uh, what I believe to be one of the most, most uh, important episodes of this podcast um, to this point and probably into the foreseeable future. Uh, reason being, I'm joined by George Wiseman, uh, an inventor, entrepreneur, and uh, now pioneer in the realms of alternative health and uh, breakthrough, uh, you know, free energy. Uh, he's the inventor of the incredible, uh, really miraculous AquaCare machine, uh, which just, you know, in a few words, uh, it's a Brown's gas, hydrogen-rich, electrically expanded water generator uh, that also structures the water to, uh, you know, whatever frequency you'd like. Uh, I've had a few weeks to use it myself. And, uh, well, it's still probably too soon to, uh, say, uh, reverse my so-called uh, type 1 diabetes I've been dealing with for a while. Um, you can definitely feel the healthful uh, and energizing effects from inhaling uh, the Brown's gas and drinking the, uh, the bubbled water. But I, I do see from, from hearing you, uh, I really listened to your, your appearances on, I think it was Crochable 7 Radio, 
uh, recently and uh, hearing about uh, you know the, the the hydrogen cleaving or I guess the the the, the uh, bacteria or the microbiome necessary to, to cleave off that hydrogen uh, from carbohydrates I think might actually be pertinent here so uh, maybe we can uh, we can get into that a little bit but uh, beyond being a brilliant uh, inventor uh, George is also a, fel a fellow pioneer with an incredible story uh, he's a man on a mission to restore health uh, to a chronically poisoned world uh, that so desperately needs it and uh, on that note he's been gracious enough uh, to offer nearly five hundred dollars off of uh, the AquaCure. Uh, using coupon code VONU, uh, that's V-O-N-U. Uh, again, use coupon, uh, coupon code VONU uh, to save $500. Uh, the link will be in the show notes. Uh, and even better yet, commissions earned uh, from any sales using the VONU coupon code will go directly to the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, as we continue our mission of accumulating the best uh, tools and resources for liberation uh, in all areas of the human experience. Uh, so I should also mention that the head of our passing Department of Energy uh, is here on this call. Uh, Bueller, welcome back to the uh, Vani podcast. Man, I think the, the last time you appeared on the, on, on, uh, the podcast was probably the first Vani Fest uh, when we did a live recording from here. So welcome back. I know you've got some questions for George. And, uh, excited That's to have true. You here. Yeah, excited to have you here. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, the last time we were on screen together was at the signing. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. I was also at the last Vani Fest as well. We didn't do a podcast, but uh, yeah, it's good to be here uh, to represent the Department of Energy and the uh, Department of Health and Wellness. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So yeah, I guess uh, without uh, anyway, without further ado, George, welcome to the uh, to the Vani Podcast, my friend. Uh, uh, how are you doing this afternoon? Uh, it's, it's an honor to speak with you. I'm I'm doing really well. It's been uh, quite a ride these last few years as I uh, developed the AquaCure, and now it's becoming more and more known out there. And in fact, I, I I've kind of cut back on how many times I I speak on platforms like yourself because every time I do, there's hundreds of sales, and mm -hmm. and my poor people over there are working as hard as feverishly as they can to make machines. But sometimes we get uh, around Christmas that we were eight weeks behind. Even though they were they were churning out machines, and we've now doubled our uh, production, and we're and we're almost caught up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's incredible. And I, I know because it was I think it was the this, the last time you were on Coachable Seven was uh, yeah it was six week backlog, and yeah I just got I just uh, just got it I guess maybe a month ago. Um, but uh, you know I knew that was coming, and I, I I was I was happy to wait for it. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, an incredible machine. And uh, again, not only you know. Um, not only uh, you know in the in the pursuit of health and and kind of this this breakthrough energy realm, but um, just uh, again yeah, paradigm shattering, um, paradigm shattering indeed. Um, hard to I guess it, it's it's hard to hard to wrap the mind around, especially if if you've been kind of raised in kind of the the, the mainstream kind of viewpoint of I guess chemistry and, and, and physics and all that. So um, anyway, yeah, George. Ever since I came across uh, your work, I've been greatly looking forward to to the uh, hopeful opportunity to chat with you. Um, so yeah, first off, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, it's truly an honor. You've you've made quite an impact on uh, a few young protégés who are driving forward uh, these areas greatly. Uh, I'll mention Sky Huddleston as as one of them. I'm not sure if you're if you're familiar with uh, him, but he's working on kind of a modified Bork engine um, project. That's that's really really neat. I interviewed him a number of podcasts back, but he he I brought him up. I brought you up to him, and and you were definitely a, an important part of his uh, his development. So I figured I'd mention that uh, that that initially. But uh, um, I guess uh, to to start off, uh, do you mind? I know I know you've you've told it time and time again, but uh, um, I know it's it's one of the it's it's a it's a really really impactful story. And um, I mean, uh, um, seems like a hardship, some hardship she had to go through um, as part of whatever you know whatever your, uh, the way that I look at it now is kind of like the soul's journey. So you had to go through these hardships to to get to where you are today to help people. So um, I guess could you tell us a little bit a little bit about your background and, and how you got here? Um. I, I grew up on a cattle ranch and we were way in the boonies. We didn't have electricity. We were so far out, we didn't even have radio. There was no uh, like a yeah, battery operated radio wouldn't even work. We couldn't catch that. So that that's a bit of a change from then till how I live now <laughs> in this world of internet and everything. Uh, so my our nearest neighbor was a mile away. My best friend lived nine miles away. I'd ride a horse to go uh, get him or to see him and, and things like that. So. Uh, it, it was it was an interesting uh, childhood, and I loved going to school because it, in school, even in the little country uh, school, it was uh, it went to grade nine in a in a little country school, but it was an hour's bus ride even to get to that school. But I, when I was in school, I didn't have to work so hard, so I <laughs> so I enjoyed going to school, and I excelled at it. Uh, I took the 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 most math and physics and chemistry and. Uh, all those kind of things that that I could, as 
it, just because I loved learning. And back on the ranch, anything you had to do, you had to do yourself. Uh, I love watching MacGyver, for example, because he just makes do with whatever is, happens to be around him. And that really is the way I grew up. <laughs> So uh, all those stories aside, uh, when I left the ranch and I, I ran into uh, ubiquitous electricity and hot and cold running water and things like that, because back on the ranch, there was no plumbing. We, we used a little uh, wooden shack in the back with a pit underneath it. <laughs> and we bathed once a week. I know it, was, it sounds terrible, but that's just the way it, things were back then. We didn't have any running water, or what have you. So it, I loved having a shower or a bathtub all to myself. I wouldn't have to share it with anyone else, like not at the same time, but one after another. I was the oldest son of seven, and the, and the youngest would always bathe first and then <laughs> using the same water. We'd warm it up a little, but yeah, it wasn't too, too nice. But that's, that gives you an idea of where I started from. And then as I, I went out and I discovered uh, the modern technologies, I decided that I didn't want to be without that ever again. So I decided I'd be an alternative energy researcher. And, uh, and, and I've learned quite a lot. Like the uh, 1966 Ford pickup truck that I had, I, I didn't know how much mileage they were supposed to get. <laughs> so when I was getting 45 miles to the gallon in a, in a F-150, uh, it, it turned out to be quite something. <laughs> in any case, and it, and it generally got, uh, now that's going across the prairies, at 45 miles an hour with a tailwind, so it, it was there was that. But generally, it got around 32 miles to the gallon. And even when I was doing 70 to 80 miles an hour in that truck, because I was a teenager and I was stupid, I was getting like uh, 24 to 27 miles to the gallon. So it was it was uh, pretty incredible uh, how I I built it up just because I I I figured out how to do things essentially, and that was back in the 70s. So the um, and as I became uh, uh, doing additional studies and went back to college for uh, automotive mechanics, uh, became an automotive technician, certified automotive technician, and I went to college for uh, farm management uh, and, and, and a few other things. So I just learned and accumulated knowledge as best I could. And I started my own business in the, in the early 80s, uh, selling, uh, doing fuel uh, savers, uh, combustion enhancement because it was something I could do. I'd, I'd learned essentially when I was a child how to do it and then just learn more. And I, I invented this uh, particular device. <laughs> it was a total accident. It was a side effect of another line of research that I was doing. And we can get into that story later if we happen to have time, but there's not much time for all the things that are going on here. So in any case, I, I had this, uh, to make a long story short, mm -hmm. Without the uh, other stuff, I was working on a vapor fuel system, and uh, I had a vapor fuel system and the and the carbureted system on a 1977 Velari at the time. And as I put in the vapors into the air going in, I had to cut back on the fuel uh, going through the regular carburetor. So then, with, as the uh, vapors were less, the carburetor had to come back in. So it had to be a smooth transition between the two. And I invented this uh, method of uh, putting a vacuum on the float bowl of the carburetor. So that a, a slight change in the in the float bowl would prevent the fuel from going over into the venturi into the engine. So the uh, as the vacuum rose and more vapors went in, the va engine vacuum rose and more vapors went in. The vacuum on the float bowl would rise as well and cut back the amount of fuel going into the engine. And because of experiments being what they are, as the uh, vapor system would fail, I would shut things off and just run on the carbureted system. But one time I forgot to shut off my vacuum system uh, on the carbureted system. And I noticed I was getting about a 30% increase in fuel mileage um, over baseline. <laughs> and my fuel saver had been shut off, my actual vapor system that I was considering to be a fuel saver. But it turns out that that little vacuum thing made the carburetor itself more efficient. And generally speaking, if you understand carburetors, it had to do with the air bleed system. The air bleed system helps the, the uh, fuel spraying into the engine turn into droplets instead of a, a, a gush. So that spray of uh, droplets would, uh, uh, when it hit the air, would evaporate the fuel better and it's the fuel vapors that burn. The fuel that's vapor when the spark plug fires is the only fuel that drives your engine. Any fuel that vaporizes after the spark plug fires is totally a waste. It, it's either burned too late or, or just goes out the exhaust. So 
the, the uh, way to get, really get fuel mileage is to make sure that your fuel is in a vapor form before the spark plug fires. Or in the case of a diesel engine, try to get as much vapor uh, before you get that compression part of the stroke where, that ignites the, cat, the uh, fuel. So in any case, um, what happened with, with what I then ended up calling a carburetor enhancer was that with that little bit of vacuum caused the air bleed system to work more efficiently and it would go out more as a mist than a spray. So the fuel droplets were very much smaller. So I didn't need as much fuel to get the same amount of vapor and the engine ran just the same, just as powerful or even more powerfully. I could gain two seconds on a zero to 60 uh, a speed test on virtually all the vehicles I did this on. Uh, so I had more horsepower, I was using less fuel, the engine ran cooler, I, it was, it, and the beauty of it was $15 worth of parts in a hardware store, an hour hood up to hood down, you had this um, on most vehicles getting a 25% increase in fuel mileage. So that was pretty good. And that's what I started my business on. So as I uh, continued into the 80s, uh, I, I was researching other sorts of uh, fuel saving devices. And one of the things out there I, re I researched was an onboard electrolyzer. So you could uh, just split water into hydrogen and oxygen and have the hydrogen going into th this mixture going into the engine to uh, enhance the combustion of the, of the fossil fuels. And that worked again, being about 25% on most vehicles. And that turned out to be called Brown's gas. I, I didn't know it at the time. I was I was experimenting with these electrolyzers, and of course, I as I'd said, I'd taken all the physics courses and and that kind of thing, so I knew how to build an electrolyzer. But I heard about this thing called Brown's gas, which I'd already been experimenting with fuel savings on the car, uh, on the vehicles. But I heard about Brown's gas being able to when it was used in a torch to like a oxyacetylene torch to replace the acetylene. I learned that it it supposedly could weld uh, tungsten to plastic or plastic to tungsten. And that turns out to be a myth, by the way. But I wanted this in my own shop because as an inventor, I was experimenting with all different kinds of welding techniques because I build things that aren't on the shelf. So I wanted the Brown's gas machine. Turns out they quoted me $300,000 to build a machine for me. <laughs> I don't know if they saw me coming or what. I just like, but that was way over my budget, like way over my budget. If I told you how much, you, you wouldn't believe me anyway. But <laughs> so... So, because uh, I'm essentially at that time doing most of my experiments, and I like doing them this way, a uh, tabletop design. You make your mistakes small when you're experimenting, because 99% of the time you're wrong. You have to really be get get good with being wrong if you're an inventor. <laughs> most things fail. But that 1%, if you can find out one thing, then you can now do something that other people can't do. And that's pretty exciting, and that's what you build on. So in any case... I already knew enough about electrolysis that I went out and studied everything I could, got all the information I could on Brown's gas. I wrote Brown's gas book one with my theories and, and uh, initial experiments. And then, and man, did I learn a lot. And then I designed the uh, electrolyzers that ended up being uh, uh, in Brown's gas book two, where people could buy it and build their own electrolyzers that could do all the things I'm going to be talking about today, which, by the way, uh, you have a technology here that can uh, increase the efficiency of uh, combustion. You can use it as its own flame. You can use it to enhance crops, like uh, uh, crops in the dirt generally grow about three times faster. Hydroponic crops can grow uh, 10 times faster. The, uh, they don't grow any bigger, they just grow faster. So you can get more crops in the same amount of uh, time, more uh, production. And, the, and then of course, we, we learned about Brown's Gas for Health, which we'll get into a little bit more. So in any case, I, I built, I designed and built and uh, this electrolyzer for my own self. And uh, I had an angel investor at that particular point working in a mine site because it turns out Brown's gas can also, when you treat ore with it, you can get more metal from the ore than you could before when you're just doing a normal uh, processing of the ore. Uh, and this one particular copper ore, they got three times more copper from the same volume of ore than they could with the regular uh, uh, processing techniques. Wow. So, the uh, it, it yeah it, it was pretty amazing, and there's there's reasons for that, and and we could even call some of it transmutation, but we'll we may or may not get into that. But in any case, I I uh, at that point I then spent somewhere around two hundred fifty thousand dollars developing this new machine that I now had in my shop that they quoted me three hundred thousand dollars for. So I did save a little money, 
And then I was able to build <laughs> machines, though, that were half the size, half the weight, and produce the same amount of gas with half the electricity because I put all my technology in it, my energy saving technologies and, and things that I'd learned as an alternative energy researcher into this machine. I made it more manufacturable. Uh, so I had a machine that was marketable and I sold several hundred of those and they went out. And then at the same, about that same time, I started selling the uh, uh, Browns gas for uh, fuel saving, which I called a high technology. So the, I, I was selling my water torches uh, so you made water as a fuel and as I called it water torch machines and I was selling the high zores. and about 1996 a customer who had bought a water torch got back to me with a story that said uh, what I did is I, I bubbled the browns gas through water and I put that water on a cotton ball and I put that tape that cotton ball onto a melanoma on my forehead and in and I just kept re-wetting the uh, cotton ball several times a day and in three weeks time, the melanoma was gone, absolutely gone. And I, that was the first time I'd ever heard of Brown's gas for health. And I was used to using Brown's gas as a combustible mixture. I knew that hydrogen oxygen mixtures are combustible is what I was doing all this time. So I didn't, I didn't believe him. I, I quite frankly, I didn't believe him. I admit it, uh, but I, I put it out there uh, to all my other hundreds of customers saying, here's a potential for use for Brown's gas, uh, this for health application. And a bunch of them did it. And, and testimonials started coming in. I, and, but I still really didn't put much weight into it until 2005. So 1996 to 2005, nine years, I, I was being told by my customers that Brown's gas for health was a good thing. So I decided to try it myself. I bubbled it in the water and I started drinking it. And in between 2005 and 2007, I didn't get sick. I was used to getting a uh, cold and flu three times a winter, every winter, like clockwork, all my life. And I didn't get sick. I thought that was pretty neat. <laughs> so, it, but the main reason I was drinking it myself was because I always try things myself. I invent things for myself. I try them myself before I, I put anything out to my customers. So the, uh, I did that, and then I, so I made a little tabletop electrolyzer that I called the ER50. So it was just a, a bunch of white pipes, uh, plumbing pipes and stuff put together. It, it was a very highly effective, uh, e um, efficient electrolyzer built on essentially what you can build in Brown's Gas Book 2. And, uh, and I put it out there so that people wouldn't have to buy a, a machine costing several thousand dollars just to in the, uh, uh, um, have the Brown's Gas bubbled water. So between 2007 and 20, December of 2015, uh, people were just bubbling in the water, and I got again a lot of testimonials in that that were telling about the Browns gas bubbled water and how well it was doing for them. And people started asking, "Can we inhale the gas?" <laughs> and I I said I said I don't think it's a good idea. This is an explosive gas. It's the most explosive gas on the planet. They, they use it, uh, if, if you watched Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, you'll, you'll see the use of a bomb the military made with the, Browns, uh, with the hydrogen oxygen air fuel bomb, and it's, and it's the most powerful bomb short of nuclear. So I'm thinking inhaling this gas is not a good idea, particularly since it can be exploded with just a static electrical spark because it ignites really easily. So the, uh, uh, all this time I was saying not, and then in December of 2016, a customer sent me a video of a Korean hydrogen bar that, and, and that so happened, I knew that the uh, technology, I knew it was Brown's gas, that these people were inhaling at this hydrogen bar. And, and then I realized that was wrong again, because hydrogen diffuses in air the fastest of any gas on the, anywhere. It, it just, it, and so, at a little teeny distance, less than a quarter of an inch from where the gas comes out the hose, it's no longer explosive. When it mixes with enough air, you have a non-combustible mixture. You still have the hydrogen, a small portion of the air, but it's no longer combustible. So if you're inhaling a mixture that has only a teeny amount of hydrogen in it, it's, it's safe, it's non-combustible, everything's good. So I realized that, and at that point, I, but at that point, I was, 24 seven caretaker of my late wife. She had, it turns out, 
a severe form of lupus. And back in the early uh, 2000s, it started to manifest uh, to the point where some of her organs were starting to fail. For example, her pancreas, so that uh, she had type 2 diabetes. And uh, as, as things went on, uh, it got worse and worse until by December of uh, 2015, uh, I was her 24-7 caretaker. I couldn't be away from her more than 30 minutes at a time. I had to carry her to, to the bathroom. I did all the things that she needed, the bathing and, and wiping and, and such. And I, I did all the cooking, uh, went and got all the food that was necessary, cleaning the house, taking care of our five cats. Uh, she couldn't even roll over in bed without assistance. And by this time she had, was legally blind, had lost most of her beautiful hair. It was actually good, good that she was blind because she loved her hair and it was one of the things that, that she suffered on the most. Believe it or not, she was a multimedia artist, uh, incredible woman, a Montessori a school teacher, just um, just amazing. I, I I have no idea why she chose me as a as a partner, but I I certainly enjoyed that she had. In any case, um, in the, in March of 2016, she she died. So at that point, I didn't really I I lost interest in living. Quite frankly, I, it was the grief was so intense. So I can understand. I appreciate that. I can understand why spouses file, follow each other, uh, because there were times when my chest was hurting so much I realized I hadn't even taken a breath. My body was forgetting to even inhale. It was it was like that that much of a a, a feeling. It, I I grew up on a cattle ranch. I'd had broken bones and and uh, I had my thumb torn off. I had I had things like that. And by the way, I just put it back on myself and you can see it still works. <laughs> but in any case, all the pain I'd ever had in the world was not, it, I couldn't, I couldn't even describe this uh, grief. So in any case, I decided at that point that I, after sitting for a couple of weeks on the couch and just kind of staring out at nothing until the cats would come and tell me they needed food or something, I would, uh, I decided I'd, I'd try to get back into my business, which at that point had been mostly failing because for several years I couldn't really work. So the people that know me, I just kind of disappeared off the map because I was taking care of my late wife. And at that point, I decided, okay, I'll, uh, I'll videotape myself. I set up a video camera in front of myself. I'll videotape myself inhaling Brown's gas. So the very first time I inhaled the Brown's gas for 15 minutes uh, one night, and uh, I, I thought, you know, if, if something happens, at least there'll be a video of my idiocy. So I, and that video is still on my YouTube channel. People can go and look at it. And if they look at it there and look at me now, they can see the difference in, in how I look. That's one of the things that you can do uh, it just for fun, if you like. So in any case, I, uh, I did that. I, I built uh, this ER50 that I had built to bubble Brown's gas in water, I modified, and I explained on the video how I modified it, so that it, I, I felt I could safely inhale the gas at a percent where it would be under the explosive limit of the gas. So the uh, and, and so I did, and it was all fine. The only side effect I had from that immediate side effect was that I did not sleep that night. I was absolutely, totally awake and alert. I had I had never had that happen to me in my entire life. I'm. I grew up where you could, I could fall asleep against a rock, you know, uh, and it just, it was disconcerting just laying there all night thinking I'm going to fall asleep any second and not falling asleep. Now, my current wife, when she first inhaled at, uh, for 15 minutes at about 630 at night, she had the best night's sleep she could ever remember. So there's no telling what's going to happen when you're inhaling the gas. I just wanted to make that uh, clear up front to people that my experience and her experience aren't necessarily gonna be the experience for everybody. Your body decides what it's going to do with the gas. And we can get into more of that a little bit later. The key thing that I want to tell people, and, and of course uh, you, you've heard my story before, uh, so you know I'm kind of shortening things a little bit, but um, after I determined that it was safe to inhale, because that's all I was doing at the time, I was just wanting to prove it was safe to inhale. I thought I was healthy. I would. <laughs> I did not expect the uh, healing things that, that ended up happening to me over time. So the what happened 
what and and people can look at that story and see the list of the things if they go to my eagle-research.life l-i-f-e website so eagle like the bird hyphen mark research dot l-i-f-e so in any case and and read about me and you can see the list of things that has happened and and see pictures of the uh, outhouse and the cattle and the cattle ranch stuff they it's all there. So in any case, yeah, it's, it's for fun. But in any case, I, uh, I I decided, okay, I will modify the ER-50, tell the people, there have been thousands of people by this time had bought the ER-50s and they were uh, bubbling it for uh, drinking. So I told the people that they could inhale if they made these modifications. They did, and more testimonials started coming in. And based on my own experience and these testimonials, 10 times better. It's 10 times better, more efficacious, more therapeutic to inhale the gas than it is to drink the bubbled water. The bubbled water is good, no question. But the inhalation, if you inhale for 12 seconds with this machine, you get as much hydrogen in your blood as drinking a liter of hydrogen-rich water. Jeez. So in, in just a few seconds, you're getting a lot more hydrogen in your blood. And in 10 or 15 minutes, uh, based on the experiments that we've done, your blood becomes saturated with the hydrogen. So at that point, you just have to inhale a little bit of hydrogen to keep uh, your blood saturated because any any the inhale that's more than saturation just, just gets exhaled again, just like ex, uh, extra carbon dioxide. Your body needs some carbon dioxide, but any excess just gets in, exhaled. And so the same with the hydrogen. How yeah, long does the blood maintain that hydrogen saturation? I'm curious. My experiments with dark field microscopy is uh, about 15 minutes. In about 15 minutes, it goes back to baseline, mm. and okay. and it takes at at a two percent hydrogen mixture inhaled, it takes about 15 minutes to saturate the blood. So after that, once it's saturated, you can inhale at a one percent mixture, and it'll keep the blood saturated. So you can you don't have to use as much uh, um, Brown's gas to just keep it saturated. And we've determined over time that longer is better than more. There's no sense going up close to the explosive limit of 4.7% um, because you're just going to exhale any that you uh, this excess anyway. But the people that are having uh, things like there's a there's a study that you can look on and the uh, I've accumulated I I posted a few there's 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 thousands now of studies of uh, hydrogen for health and I posted a few on the uh, dot life website eagle hyphen research dot life website one of them is a cancer person who did brown's gas only to mitigate her cancer and that, and because it's a study i can mention it uh and uh, otherwise i'm not an md so i can't uh prescribe or advise or anything like mm -hmm. that so the um in this, in this case she had lung cancer that had metastasized to her brain and she uh, it started inhaling the brown's gas and that's the only thing she did, but she did it for at least eight hours a day. And then mm -hmm. I forget it was three, six months, something when she came back for her checkup, next checkup, the brain cancer was entirely gone and the lung cancer was, was go almost gone. So it was uh, quite amazing. So, in, in, and there's stories like that all over the place now. So we get back to the, um, to the people now that are, are sending in the testimonials. And I just described how bad it was when not, when my wife, past. I had a testimonial come in from a woman that absolutely floored me, literally floored me. And I couldn't, I, I, it, it almost killed me. A testimonial almost killing me because this woman had lupus and her lupus symptoms after inhaling the Brown's gas were gone in three weeks time. I had right. battled this disease with my late wife for almost a decade. And I had Brown's gas in my shop in the 80s. I had been working with it for over 30 years. I had this thing that got rid of lupus all this time and never used it. I, I was $300,000 in debt at the time because we were trying every single alternative energy solution that we could to try to deal with this wonderful woman's autoimmune disease. And here in my own shop, God had given me this technology and told me that it works for, for health in 1996. I, I took till 2005 before I even tried it myself. 
And if I had been able to listen to this, it would have it would have changed my life. But I didn't. So here we are. I decided the only way that I could live with myself, justified living and breathing, because in in kind of a way I almost felt like I, I killed my wife because she it was my own mm. neglect, my own not listening to things that, that caused this to happen. So I I decided that I would help as many people as possible not go through what we did. That is my passion. And I'm working as hard as I can to make that happen. And the testimonials that I'm getting are very grateful. It makes it it makes it um, it makes it worthwhile getting up at 3:30 in the morning every morning, and I work till off until 8 p.m. at night every day, weekends and holidays included. I am passionate about helping as many people as possible. I've got 20 people in my shop building machines, and I I'm I made a I'm making a manufacturing course so that we can help other people manufacture machines like I'm doing because I want one of these in every home. Mm -hmm. Just like Henry Ford wanted an automobile in every driveway. Yep. I want one of these machines in every home. I can't do it myself yeah. and I don't want to be an Elon Musk and build a gigafactory and, and just build them myself. I, I want people all over the world in every community building these things. Because another problem with new technologies is there are no technicians. So if we can, if I can have a manufacturing course, I not only spread the health and the wealth, because how many people in the last couple of years have lost their jobs or their, their income or their way to make a living? Mm -hmm. So here's a way they can help other people and uh, make a living for themselves. And they become a trained technician. So suddenly there's trained technicians all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I've developed that I'm in the process of developing this manufacturing course, which I hopefully will be out by June, and people can send me an email using the contact page, contact us page on the Dot Life website, and and just ask, and I'll I'll send a quick email saying how they can get on the list to uh, be one of these manufacturers if they desire. Now it is it, it will cost ten thousand dollars for the course to uh, so I'll just say that up front uh, to get this uh, training. But once you're trained, you can build the Aquacure just exactly the same as I do. And you'll also uh, be invited, you, your choice, to join this uh, consortium of people who are working together so we all help each other. If somebody has a good idea, we spread it around, that sort of thing. So we all help each other around the world. We make these machines to have one in every home. So that, that pretty much brings us up to date. <laughs> okay. Well, it's stories like yours that are actually really inspiring and um... – I can't help but want to get this message out as well. At, at first, it seems counterintuitive to be breathing or drinking a flammable gas, and I can understand why you waited so long to do so. But you know, after learning about it, I can understand why you don't want to hold back anymore. And uh, we want to help you get this word out too. So my experience uh, the first night here, um, he had me uh, drink the water that was bubbled with the gas. And uh, I had had uh, heartburn and indigestion going back at least a few months uh, dealing with, you know, daily life stressors and things like that. But um, it had caused a lot of uh, heartburn and indigestion. I had had ulcers in the past and um, I actually had, you know, it took me about a couple days drive to get here. And so I had been eating, you know, a lot of sugary foods on the road and drinking coffee. So when I got here, I had already had a lot of uh, acid going on in my stomach. And he had me drink the water and within five minutes, I would say I could feel like my stomach acid had been completely buffered. And um, I even felt like a little bit of a clear headedness, like a fog had lifted from my brain just from drinking the water. I hadn't even breathed the gas yet. And um, for a number of days afterward, I would say my stomach felt like it was buffered against not only acidic food and drink, but like the effects of sugars and stress and things like that. One other thing I had noticed when I first drank the water is that it reminded me of uh, hydride. So I used to actually take a supplement from uh, Patrick Flanagan, which was called Microhydrin. Uh, it's, uh, it's a silica hydride supplement. And I know you're familiar with Patrick Flanagan. And when I first heard about Brown's gas and some of the effects, I wasn't sure whether it was uh, just molecular hydrogen or if there was some hydride ions or like you've discovered, there's an entirely new gas altogether. And uh, so I couldn't help 
but want to know, like wrap my brain around what was actually causing this effect. But um, I've been breathing the gas now um, every day. And uh, it does have like this clear headed clarity that comes to me. It kind of lifts me out of a fog and I really love it. But uh, drinking the water every day really seems to keep my stomach buffered against all acidity. And I really love it. And uh, I can even eat some of my problem foods like to some degree and uh, I have like a lot less uh, indigestion and so forth. So uh just the small effect that i've had within a matter of five minutes of drinking the water was i would say miraculous because i had months of suffering alleviated in five minutes so i encourage everyone to try this even for minor ailments but as we've seen it can help for even the major illnesses too so uh yeah i just want to help get the word out and i'm glad you're here and uh thank you for joining us on the on the podcast today i really i'm really inspired by the work that you're doing not only that but like i want to see if we can also start um helping people save gas <laughs> too yeah. as well so yeah so one of the things that i when i was listening uh, as far as encouragement goes one of the things i do to encourage people as well is i have a one year satisfaction guarantee you can try it your money is safe you can get a refund if you return it within a year you, I, there are not many people doing that but i want as many people as possible to get a good try with it because some things it takes time. It's nutrition. To it's not a drug. It, the hydrogen is nutrition, literally. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. But so sometimes sometimes things take time to resolve. It took years to get to wherever you are. It get it takes uh, months or well sometimes it's it's days or weeks, but months to resolve for your body to re get back to health uh, to get healthy again. So. For example, one of the first things that uh, I discovered was psoriasis. I had uh, a white, thick uh, skin on my elbows, knees, and feet, which I thought was calluses because I grew up on a cattle ranch and I had lots of calluses. And, and so I'd had this most of my life. Well, that started to peel off like a snake shedding its skin. And <laughs> it was very disconcerting to have large pieces of my skin peeling off. But underneath was baby smooth beautiful skin and, and it was, wasn't painful or anything it was just peeling off so what happened was my psoriasis uh, peeled off and that happened within three weeks time of my inhaling and then there was um uh, but yeah uh, okay so I'll, I'll come back to that there, there's actually a little bit of um I, i'm sorry i i just had to uh <laughs> wipe my eyes and blow my nose a little bit here no problem at all just, yeah, just uh, leftovers from, okay. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the, the heart, you, you know. In any case, what happened, uh, we, we'll start to say, answer the question, if hydrogen is so important, where do we get it? We can't inhale it like we do oxygen. And our bodies are 67% hydrogen by volume, 24% carbon, or sorry, oxygen, 24% oxygen, 12% carbon, and 2% everything else. So when they're talking about the importance of magnesium and uh, and uh, all, all together, the vitamins and such and minerals, they're talking about the 2%. The 62% is the hydrogen. So since it's so important, it's our major macronutrient, where do we get it? We get it from our food. So our digestive system is really important. We start with uh, mastication, we're chewing our food, we put some enzymes in there, it drops into our tummy uh, where it gets a nice acid bath and, uh, and breaks down some more and some nutrition comes off there, goes into the lower intestines with the bile and the, and the other uh, bacteria that start to work on it. But the hydrogen doesn't come off until almost at the end, in your colon, large intestine. That's where the bacteria live that finally break the hydrogen off from the carbons, break that uh, atomic bond, which is a very strong bond. So it needs all the enzymes and catalysts and, and everything it can get, and then the specialized bacteria to get that off. And when the hydrogen is freed, then it goes right through your intestinal wall and into your bloodstream. So your, your intestines actually breathe because they accept gases from your uh, digestive system. So in any case, the um, that particular bacteria are very sensitive to things like glyphosate, antibiotics, uh, artificial sweeteners, all uh, a host of things that we are ingesting these days kill those particular type of bacteria. So many people are hydrogen deficient. If you have a scar anywhere on your body, like I had, I had many scars, 
you are hydrogen deficient because what your body is doing is patching instead of uh, instead of healing. So getting back to what happens, if you're hydrogen deficient, the first thing that happens is your uh, your body who knows how to keep life in, in you. Uh, a quick example is hypothermia. If you're starting to get too cold, your body will reduce or shut off uh, blood flow to your limbs to preserve core temperature. Your body knows how to survive. Our bodies are absolutely incredible. As I learn more and more, I'm just astonished every day at how our bodies know how to heal themselves and keep ourselves mm -hmm. healthy, if provided everything they need to do. So the first thing the body does, if it doesn't have enough hydrogen, if you're hydrogen deficient, is shut off extraneous systems that aren't immediately life-threatening. First one to go usually is the regeneration system. So people start to age quicker, they scar instead of, uh, instead of the skin healing, that sort of thing. The next thing that the body shuts off if it's still hydrogen deficient is your immune systems. You have several immune systems, but the body starts shutting them off because it isn't immediately life-threatening, but now you get sick easier. So a side effect of taking antibiotics you, it cures whatever that problem is, but it kills the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. And a long-term side effect is that you, you get sick easier after you've taken the antibiotics. So, and I'm not saying anything against antibiotics and, and, uh, and, and the various technologies that modern medicine has come up with. I'm just saying there's these side effects that the person has to be aware of. Okay, so then if you're still hydrogen deficient, your organs start to fail. And at that point, um, after that, you die. You just that that's the end. So, when I started to inhale, one of the first things that happened was my organs started to heal, which was my skin, for example, and my uh, um, heart. I had a heart murmur all my life, and I went in for a physical because of some things I was doing required a physical. And the uh, and I told the doctor I had a heart murmur, and he said, "No, you don't." <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Wow. That's it. It was incredible. So um, the next thing that happened was I noticed that my scars had healed and and uh, and and my warts. I had hand warts and I had a, a planter's wart on my foot. Nasty stuff, but they're viruses. Warts are viruses. OK. And my body immune systems got strong enough to get rid of all those warts. They were totally gone. Plus, I haven't been sick since 2005. I've, I've had the sniffles three times. Once was just a week ago, actually, believe it or not. But in any case, I've had, uh, that's it. That, that's as sick as I've gotten in, in, since 2005. With all the stuff that happened to me, I, was, I had major life changes. Obviously, I, I had moved. I was deep in debt. Uh, I had a, a wife that, was, uh, that I had to take care of and, and, and died, so I was in grief. I had... If you, if you name top 10 of the stressors that would cause people to have their immune system lowered, I probably had at least seven of them. So in any case, I didn't get sick. That was, that was uh, one thing, one big advantage of all of this that, that's been going on. And that is a blessing, a huge blessing. Now, so just to, just to keep in mind, you get all these different health uh, benefits. Your body heals itself as, as it goes back up. Um, so I got rid of it. My immune systems turned back on. My regeneration system turned back on, which got rid of the uh, scars on my body and my neuropathies. Now, neuropathies generally have to do with the nerves and uh, and your body them either degenerating or your body not having the, the uh, communication with them anymore. And one of the biggest nerve centers is is uh, between your ears, in your brain, or, sorry, yeah, in your head. So you've got um, the, uh, all the different kinds of things that involve nerves. Are also healed with this. So I had I was losing the feeling in the palm of my left hand, and it was just continuing up. I thought I was going to lose the use of my hand. Well, that completely resolved. I have total uh, functionality. My arthritis is gone. I have full strength and uh, and function, and zero pain in my in my hands. The neuropathy is on the fronts of my shins, which both I had totally lost a feeling in that skin. But now I'm describing a person that that considered himself to be healthy, by the way. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and my back hurt. There was a lot of pains and stuff. So I'm pain-free these days. And I am seriously grateful. Young people have no idea what it is to be old and have pain, chronic pain, all the time. So 
being able to resolve that was was huge. You were saying going to say something, but anyway, I did, I, did, I thought one of you guys would like to chime in sure, there. Sure, I, I I could jump in real quick. Let's... Um, so I was I was going to mention um, so like a, what what really set me down the path of like the the health liberation angle was trying to reverse my so-called type one diabetes. And obviously, I went I, I read a lot on um, you know we're we're talking about like you know carb carb like carbohydrate intolerance to a certain degree, right? Um, they're different diseases. I don't think they're really they're not really related at all. I think type two, you know, so-called type two, is more um, you know, more lifestyle deficiencies, whereas, or, whereas I, I guess type one could be too. But um, regardless, I kind of see them as, as as different. But what 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 struck me when I was I listened to you on Critical Seven Radio was that when you when you were talking about, them, I mean, I was I was part of the night the you know the the nineteen nineties where you know they they use antibiotics for everything. So that was what I grew up on was antibiotics, basically like vitamins. Um, so that definitely probably contributed. So I'm I'm definitely familiar familiar with that angle. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, you're, we're talking about you know where do people get their hydrogen from? They get them from carbohydrates. And if you don't have that, you know those microorganisms that cleave that, um, and then you also factor in too, like as, as a child, I ate a lot of you know that processed carbohydrates. So um, ma that's ma uh, mainly all I ate. So um, I mean, I can only imagine how much stress that put on my pancreas um, and, and, and that too. So um, regardless, I, I, I see a, I see a, a very definitely like as far as like a root cause, you know, like a root root cause solution here. Um, I think like cause a lot of people are dealing with you know the, these issues of metabolic syndrome, which um, and rapid aging. And uh, I, I think that definitely has to do with um, I, I'm I'm of the opinion where you know there's um, other than you know getting into kind of the the more I guess the more um, spiritual influences like the Paracelsus would cover. Um, I, I'm of the opinion that really the only two causes of so-called disease are, are deficiencies and um, chronic poisoning. Um, and usually the deficiencies are caused by the chronic poisoning, um, at least in, in, the, in these modern days. So um, I guess uh, what uh, if I, I, I guess the, the general question here for you, George, is um, since you've been you know, digging into this for, for years, um, and I guess you have some familiarity with, with type 2 diabetes, I think you said earlier, um, I guess what what are your what are your thoughts on 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 that on that area with that being a pretty major major problem nowadays? And I guess aquacure is well, a, the, a yeah, solution. Yeah, that is a major problem. And 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 actually, in uh, 1977, the United States government commissioned a study on uh, the nutrition in North America in in America. And the the uh, commission came back with and did a report saying that it, essentially. They had a bad diet. The standard American diet was uh, too high in uh, carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, and the, uh, the the food manufacturers actually had it removed from the government bookshelves. They had that entire study removed from the government, lobbied to have it removed, and and did have it removed. I happen to have a copy from a person who got it before it was removed, but they they. Uh, so this has been known for a long time, and mm -hmm. we've been deliberate. It's been deliberately done to us, because people are not aware that they there are no essential carbohydrates, like you have essential nutrients of, of one kind or another. There are no essential carbohydrates. So the what you need to do is get the carbohydrates from food that is actually nutritious. And uh, when you're saying it about type one and type two, the big difference that I understand about type one and type two is type one diabetes your pancreas is not making enough insulin. You actually have to supplement with insulin or you will die. All right. And the um, and type two is just the opposite. Type two, your pancreas is making more insulin mm -hmm. than, uh, it's, it's actually, type two is, is uh, what, I, as a goat farmer, there's a, ty a term we call overeating disease. Won't go into that. But what's happening is people are eating too much simple uh, carbohydrates the blood sugar rises, the pancreas uh, tries to get, they call it insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Type 2 diabetes is actually better named insulin resistance. So it's a, it's a downward spiral in that as you eat too much simple carbohydrates, uh, your pancreas makes the insulin that pushes that uh, glucose, because the carbohydrates turn into glucose in the blood, and it pushes the glucose into the cells. But when the cells get full, they don't want any more. So the... Uh, it, it, the pancreas has to actually make more insulin to keep forcing this food into the cells that don't want anymore. So mm -hmm. the cells start shutting their mouth and saying, no, I don't want it. So they have to produce more and more insulin to the point where the pancreas cannot produce enough insulin to get the blood sugar uh, stuffed into the cells because the cells are being insulin resistant. So the, uh, the, the, way, the, the best way with type 2 diabetes is to simply stop eating. 
I'm not joking. Fasting. Yep. Fasting is absolutely mm. the quickest way to bring your body back into normal and reverse all the issues with the uh, type 2 diabetes. But Big Pharma, in their infinite wisdom, decided, no, what we'll do is we'll help the pancreas. We'll add additional insulin. So in addition to the insulin you're already giving, getting, we're going to add even more so that we can get the blood sugar pushed into these cells that don't want the extra glucose anymore anyway. And then, of course, you still have to keep uh, uh, upping the insulin because those cells get more and more insulin resistant. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, people who are type 2 diabetes can often turn into type 1 diabetes as the pancreas gets overworked to the point where the beta cells, they just, they just quit. Mm -hmm. They just can't make any more. They're overworked. So that's kind of how I see the, uh, the type 1 and type 2. I'm very sorry to hear about your type 1 because unless you can somehow get the pancreas uh, back functioning again, you're going to be supplementing with insulin, I assume, pretty yep. much the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And you're not the only one. So the, um, we, there, there's a long story of what, uh, how I discovered all of this with, uh, with our cats, actually, first. It turns out that 20% uh, of house cats are um, um, diabetic because they give the cats uh, uh, carbohydrates. And people think they're like a dog is a is an omnivore, so it can take carbohydrates. But cats are obligate carnivores, so they must have protein only. If you give them things like rice and and uh, and potatoes and and uh, peas and carrots, uh, which they often mix into the cat food, they call it the garden variety, <laughs> garden mixture or whatever. Um, the cats love it. Oh, they, I I had this one cat that loved peas and corn. He would just eat them up. But it's like candy to them. This simple carbohydrates. And it does exactly the same thing as sugar does in our in our bloodstreams, uh, which is why they love this uh, this cat food. So the dried cat food is is often loaded with these carbohydrates, and so people are feeding dried cat food to their house cats are often contributing to them end up being diabetic. And the and the way to stop that is to just give them meat, give the take cut out all simple carbohydrates completely. Okay, so. Uh, as far as helping the uh, your body heal, the Brown's gas will. Your body, if it can heal, given what it needs to heal, it will heal. Any any good medical doctor will tell you that they don't cure disease. They some medical doctors think they're gods and they and, and they think that it's all them. You know, you get better, they they take credit for it. But really, the best a doctor can do, bar none is put the body in a, in a state, give the body what it needs to heal itself. It, besides mm -hmm. setting broken bones, but then the, bro the actual break has to heal. So get the body in a, in a position where it can heal itself. So in our case, what we're talking about is giving the body the essential nutrition that it needs to heal itself. And virtually every autoimmune disease uh, and, and things like uh, the cancer are caused by or exacerbated by lack of hydrogen, pure and simple. And you can you can go out and get hydrogen in nine different varieties, I, uh, nine different ways I know of putting hydrogen into your body. I wrote a little blog on it that I can point people to if they if they send me an email. And so you can look at all these modalities and and get hydrogen into your body. Any way that you can get hydrogen into your body is going to help. You. Now I concentrate on Brown's gas because it's the most therapeutic. They're, they're, because not in addition to the hydrogen, you also get something called electrically expanded water. Now, back in 1996, uh, I built small electrolyzers, which eventually became the ER50, by the way. But they were made out of transparent PVC plastic, so I could actually look inside and see what was happening. And I discovered something that I had never seen before. In all the physics courses that I'd taken, all the books that I had read, I saw something that had never been described before in any electrolysis. I saw a line of gas coming up right in the middle of the cell. I saw hydrogen coming off the cathode, I saw oxygen coming off the anode, and I saw a line of gas coming right out of the fluid itself. I did not know what that was, <laughs> but it was there. And as an inventor, I, I'm not like a scientist. That's, I, yeah, that's normal for a simple electrolyzer design, is it not? No. No, absolutely. No. The, okay. the hydrogen and the oxygen is normal, but this this uh, bubbles that are mm -hmm. coming out of the fluid. Now, of course, in, in normal electrolyzers, 
the solution gets full of bubbles really fast. So it, it seems like there's bubbles coming right out of the solution because the hydrogen and oxygen infuse into the uh, fluid. And so there's hydrogen and oxygen bubbles in there. But what I'm talking about is when you first start it up and there's no hydrogen and oxygen bubbles in the solution itself, bubbles were being formed in the center of the electrolyzer that were not attached or formed by either electrode. It was coming right out of the solution. So this was absolutely unique. Now, there's been other people that have uh, developed Brown's gas machines uh, with this design before me, so it wasn't unique to me, but it was unique to my experience. It was the first time I'd seen it, and it's the first time anyone has reported it, as far as I know, so back in 1996. All right, so I, I started to, and, and this is one of the things about an inventor, and in, in inventing, once in a while you see something, and then it, it becomes a passion, and you... Uh, and you're able to do more things with it. Okay, so it turns out that what this is, it, it, the, the most workable theory hypothesis at, at the moment, and it's been uh, um, being tested like with the University of Washington and a lot of other places as well, is that this is a plasma form of water. So my electrolyzers, you remember I was saying they were twice as efficient as the uh, Brown's gas ones that you could buy kind of thing. One of the reasons was right. I had optimized it for making this particular gas, which we call electrically expanded water. So it's a plasma form of electron rich plasma form of water. So it's negatively charged plasma. It's actually water. See, my electrolyzers were actually making gas 130% efficient, which means there was 30% more gas than theoretically possible by the Faraday equations, which had been, I don't know, 150 years at that time, Faraday had invented them and no one had ever had an electrolyzer get over 100% efficient. So there was, a, there was a gas that was happening in that electrolyzer. That it wasn't over 100% efficient, by the way. What was happening is, is electrically expanded water is another gas that's a side effect of the electrolysis and that isn't part of the Faraday equations. So okay, as Yeah, the, it's uh, an additional gas that's not hydrogen or oxygen and it's contributing to the volume and the pressure. Exactly, you got it. Okay. okay. So it turns out that this gas is therapeutically active as well. When you're, when you're inhaling or bubbling it in the water, you're putting electrons in the water, you're putting this energy and, and frequencies and stuff into the water that the water wouldn't have had if you just had hydrogen. So the hydrogen technologies are good, and there's thousands of studies out there proving they're good. Not only are they good, but they have virtually zero negative side effects. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. it doesn't hurt anything. Hydrogen kills nothing. It, 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 you can't use it like an antibiotic or anything because it doesn't kill anything. Right. All it does is I have had health. some experience using a hydride and hydrogen, molecular hydrogen in the past, but also hydride ions as well. And um, it almost seems like this functions in a very similar way as like an electron donor. It, am I right there somehow? That's exactly right. Which is okay. one of the reasons that it, it helps the uh, dyspnea and, and uh, lung inflammation that's happening with this uh, local or this uh, more recent uh, pandemic kind of thing that's going on. Uh, because when you're inhaling the gas, it, it gives the body the electrons it needs to stop the oxidative cascade. So mm -hmm. oxidation in a person's body is uh, mitigated with hydrogen, but the oxidation is mitigated by these extra electrons that you're getting. So uh, a cascade is essentially, you have uh, some sort of a molecule that uh, is electron deficient, so it will, grab an electron from something else that then that becomes oxidized becomes electron deficient so that thing goes and grabs an electron from something else and and so you get this cascade happening so if you can put those electrons in then it stops the cascade now it turns out that when people are ill there's there's two uh, things that are usually happening first of all their energy generation systems the mitochondria in the cell and and what have you have been uh, compromised. They're, they, they're, they're, they're pleated. They, they aren't working uh, functional as, as well as they should. And their energy reserves have been depleted. So they don't have the energy necessary to heal themselves. Hydrogen itself is like a building block of life. It's like a brick. And it doesn't do anything by itself. It's essential, but it doesn't do anything unless it, uh, energy comes along, uh, um, intelligent energy. It's like if you have a pile of bricks, you can't just assume that that pile of bricks is ever going to turn into a brick house. You have to have somebody come along, take the energy to put it in a form that ends up being a brick house. 
our bodies are like that. The hydrogen is, is like the bricks. You need the, the, uh, the energy to heal. So the Brown's gas provides not only the hydrogen, but the energy. And your body provides the intelligence necessary to know where, to, where, where it should go and what it should do. Yeah, I've long thought that a lot of diseases and disorders are oxidative stress related and uh, and oxidative stress is also, I, I call it an electron deficiency, and I consider most people to be electron deficient. So any way to supplement those electrons, such as brown gas, Brown's gas, is uh, it's, it's going to have all sorts of systemic effects beyond just uh, the antioxidant effect. Like I said, I felt like it was actually buffering my stomach acid and... Uh, I, I believe that might also have something to do with the electrons too, but I'm not sure. Yes, I, I, exactly so. And, and that's, it's amazing how many different ailments, uh, like there's been hundreds of them now studied in science are, are mitigated just simply with the, uh, brown, with the hydrogen. And if you're doing it with the Brown's gas, then it, it turns out it, it seems to be about 30% more therapeutically effective. So I'm leaving the hydrogen technologies to everyone else, and I'm concentrating on the Brown's gas because I find it to be the most therapeutic, effective, and I want to help people the very best I can. Now, a lot of the hydrogen technologies are a lot less expensive, at least up front, like if you're taking hydrogen tablets. Uh, like I say, there's nothing wrong with that. But over time, they actually cost you more than buying a Brown's gas machine because you're buying these tablets every uh, week or month or whatever it happens oh, to be that yeah. you're doing. Patrick Flanagan's process is uh, patented and proprietary, so I'm sure you know it's it's uh, going to cost more. Yes. So it, it, and and when you have a machine, you can make as much as you want, and it's and I I right. have a, I'm specifically going for the home use. Now there are people out there that are going for uh, hospital grade machines uh, that are intended for hospitals, but. Really, this is something, it's like food, it's nutrition. People should be doing it every day and, uh, and even multiple times a day, just like you eat. And incidentally, I only eat once a day, <laughs> somewhere between 10 and, and 2 uh, in the afternoon. And one meal a day is, is, is sufficient now that I'm inhaling the uh, Brown's gas because I'm getting most of my, of my essential nutrition with that hydrogen mm -hmm. without any calories. So people that this is really important <laughs> when it comes back for the diabetes, for example, you, you, you don't need to eat as much food. So therefore you won't need as much insulin. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, if your pancreas is able to do any insulin, you're probably going to help it start to heal. And, and so I'm thinking that that's a good thing. And over time, again, it took years to get to where you are. It'll take years to heal if yep. your body can. Yep, exactly, exactly. And like I said a little bit ago, um, yeah, it was like I, I made a, a lifestyle change, a dietary lifestyle change, and started eating more kind of like nose to tail carnivore, and then, and then went really radical with it, and really high quality animal products and, and organs and such. And um, obviously, yeah, the the reduction of carbohydrates um, was was obviously a major thing. And then um, fixing, you know, some of those more you know, those micro those micro more of those micronutrient deficiencies, um, like eating the eating the beef liver, I think was very very good for that. So like even just fixing those, like the, it's 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 night and day compared to how I felt before. Um, now I'm not there yet. Like I I am still insulin insulin dependent, but I'm I'm, I'm same opinion that you are. Um, I guess my my viewpoint is that if there's blood running to the organ, there's always hope. So um, and it's not rotting inside. You know, it's not rotting rotting out of me, right? Um, so basically, um, yeah, it took it took twenty plus years of um, of, you know, the Babylon pharmaceuticals, as I call it, and, um, the terrible lifestyle and, and all that stuff too. Um, so it's not going to magically be reversed within, you know, just a few years. So, um, I, 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 yeah, even if it takes a little while, I'm, I'm still optimistic about it. And I think Aqua here is, uh, is definitely a, a really, really, really positive, um, really, really good for, for a lot of things, um, even beyond that. So, um, I suppose I, just one question that comes to mind, um, is I've been getting into monoatomics um, as well, and obviously, if you get into this area, that's that th those come up. Um, I was wondering if um, if monoatomics play any part in, in, in the Brown's gas or the Aquacure machine, or, or if they're trans if they're created, or, or or I guess could you speak to that? Yes, uh, that is one of the interesting things about the Brown's gas. It's got six di different constituents, so it's a gaseous mixture. You've got your H2, which is the hydrogen, your O2, which is the oxygen. Those are the two major gases. You've got your electrically expanded water, which is the what I call EXW, which is H2O. It's still water. 
but it's in a, a plasma form. So you've got your four different uh, levels of uh, 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 matter. You've got your solid, which is ice, your liquid, which is water, your uh, uh, vapor or gas, which is uh, water vapor or steam, and you have your plasma, which is the electrically expanded water. So the electrically expanded water is a, is a plasma form of water. And so you have that as the third constituent. Then you have your water vapor, because anytime you have a water mixture, you're gonna have some water vapor in the air. And lastly, to address the monatomic, there's a very small amount of H and O, not H2 and O2, H and O. And this is not possible. <laughs> Any scientist will well, tell would you. It be the, would it possibly be the H minus ion, also known as hydride? Um, possibly, yes. Uh, okay. I, I haven't been able to uh, discover or isolate exactly what's going on. But when you do a spectrographic analysis, you will see the bump at H and the bump at O. At, at, that would be uh, hmm. 1 and 8, if I remember correctly. Okay, so yeah. In any case, you, you will see that it's there. It's, it's uh, manifestly there. So, but it's supposed to be not possible. The, uh, the O's should be finding an O2 or, or something else to attach to. Same with the H's, it should go to an H2, but for some reason it doesn't. Unless it now, captured an extra, an extra electron. It, it, and it's possible, yeah, that could be it. Um, and, and just the opposite for the oxygen. But in any case, the uh, uh, Yule Brown called the Brown's gas a fluid crystal. He, he, had, he had done a, quite a lot of research in this kind of thing. So it's possible that there's a matrix involved here as well, where interaction between things that cause it to stay apart and not actually join. And uh, uh, Gerald Pollack of the University of Washington uh, uh, developed something, actually it was one of his students that developed it um, or discovered it, uh, called uh, the fourth phase of water, uh, EZ zone water, okay? And the, um, so EZ stands for exclusion zone water. And it actually isn't water, it's, uh, it's H3, uh, H, H2, yeah, it's H3O2. So like hydrogen peroxide is not water, that's H2O2. Um, H3O2 mm -hmm. is a gel. It's not actually water. But when you have this uh, gel, which is absolutely essential to life, by the way, this is one of the most important discoveries. He should be getting a Nobel Prize or a student should or any case. <laughs> the, uh, for the discovery of this uh, EZ gel, uh, because it's actually what makes our bodies work. If, uh, if it wasn't for that gel coating every single red blood cell and on the inside of every one of our veins, arteries, and capillaries, the red blood cells could not flow through our uh, circulatory system, for example. And it's the gel that, that plumps up every cell in our body, this exclusion zone gel. So it, it, it's, it's very, very slippery is, is essentially what I'm saying. And, and for some, it, it actually looks like it may be as important as the heart is for the circulatory system because the, the, the way the electrons are and stuff, it actually starts to flow in the capillaries without even the, the heart pumping. They, they've made artificial capillaries and, and the easy, the electron zone actually makes flow without even a heart, without a pump at all, no pump. So the, uh, it, but the capillaries are so small that they're only about a, the, the red blood cells three times larger than a capillary. So it has, the red blood cells have to actually to squeeze through, yeah. squeeze into a, like a hot dog shape and actually squeeze and squeeze through. And there's no possible way it could do it if it wasn't this slipperiness on the red blood cells and the capillaries, for example. So in any case, when uh, um, electrically expanded water is put into, uh, bubbled into water, like the Brown's gas is bubbled into water that has the exclusion zone, the exclusion zones grow dramatically. So that's happening in our bodies as well. In addition mm -hmm. to providing the hydrogen and the energy, we're enhancing this exclusion zone uh, uh, aspect of our, of our life. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> Very good. So, so we've been going yeah, for, we, we, yeah, we could, and... we could go a lot further on the, on the health stuff. And I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to Bueller. And we, I still want, I want to get some of the more of the, the van nomad free energy applications here, but uh, obviously this is super important. So I, I want to make sure we close, close this out um, sufficiently. Um, Bueller, did you have anything else you wanted to get in on, on this regard? Um, well, I guess I just, uh, I guess, I guess I have a couple comment or a couple questions and a comment. Uh, um, I guess the one comment would be, 
um, that perhaps in the electron rich environments, you are able to have the existence of stable hydride, uh, at least temporarily until it donates that electron. And uh, so I, I noticed that when I first drank the water, uh, the smell and the taste and even the feel kind of reminded me of hydride. And uh, I felt like either it contained hydride or it was donating electrons in the same manner. So uh, that's definitely something interesting to look into. And my other question, I guess, is about the electrically expanded water. Um, so it's actually captured extra electrons. Do you know, like, if it has like a charge of like, say, negative two or how many extra electrons does each molecule capture and hold? We are still trying to discover that. Uh, we can we can find we've done experiments, for example, that people can do uh, where you take uh, regular hydrogen and you bubble it in water and and look at what, something called the ORP oxygen reduction potential. And it's measured in millivolts and the millivolts are uh, essentially made by electrons so that the more electrons there are, the more negative charge the uh, the water will acquire. So when you are just bubbling hydrogen through the water the uh, negative charge is slow to develop and doesn't develop very much. When you when you bubble the Brown's gas in the water, and the only difference between the Brown's gas and the hydrogen, uh, oxyhydrogen mixture we were using, is the electrically expanded water. The negativity of the water drops dramatically, very fast and very low. So mm -hmm. you're looking at a negative okay. ORP of uh, minus 300 or something like that. Uh, just just uh, so people are aware, tap water, uh, my tap water, uh, the city tap water here, is positive 400, which means when I drink that tap mm. water, which I don't, by the way, but if I did drink that tap water, which most people do, it actually takes electrons from your body <laughs> and puts them into the water yes. to neutralize it. Your body actually soaks energy from your body to, uh, to mm -hmm. uh, neutralize the water. So you want to drink water, which has a, a negative ORP, so that the water can give you not only hydration, but give that energy uh, into your body, it give, it be electron rich. Yeah, it seems like perhaps the expanded water might actually have a higher capacity to hold electrons than hydrogen, because perhaps the, the valence shell of hydrogen is full at two electrons, whereas say the, the valence shells of the water molecule, I have no idea. So, and I heard a podcast where you had spoken recently. Uh, are the electrons actually in like excited or extra valence shell states? Or is it because of the extra electrons they fill up the next shell? That's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> okay. I won't pretend okay. to. All I know is that there are extra electrons. I don't know how they're configured onto the molecules. Okay. But it does seem like perhaps the expanded water does have the capacity to carry more electrons than just hydrogen alone. And it might Correct. be because of that, but there's got to be it more research be. to do. It, that's actually uh, either of those ways is possible. And we are, like I said, with the University of Washington, um, Gerald Pollack, uh, he and I are working together with his students to do various experiments. And we have discovered that Brown's gas is significantly different has different characteristics than what I call oxyhydrogen. So there's a machines out there with the old style Faraday electrolysis, which have a membrane between the uh, cathode and anode so they can separate the gases. The gas, because hydrogen comes out one hose, oxygen comes out the other. So in but electrolysis- that will also like, prevent the formation of expanded water, correct? That is correct. It turns out okay. there was a Chinese uh, inventor that uh, discovered something called an electron bridge that forms between the anode and cathode in an electrolyzer that does not have a membrane. And the this electron bridge is how the electricity is being stuffed into the water. So the water is soaking up electricity, these electrons, like a sponge soaks up water until it just comes so full mm. that it becomes a gaseous form of water, which is this plasma, which is not water vapor or steam. If you cool the, the ga gaseous mixture, it does not condense like uh, in, into condensation, like uh, water vapor or steam. Yeah, vapor. it's not vapor, yeah. That's correct, it's plasma. Interesting. And it's totally healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm living proof. Yes, and so am I. Uh, the, the kind of things that have happened to me, literally, I tell you true, if I lost everything, and I'm doing pretty good these days, 
I, I, I paid off all my debts. I have some money in the bank. I, I own my uh, my vehicles and home free and clear, that sort of thing. I, if I lost everything, the first thing I would be trying to do is get back a hydrogen, uh, a Browns gas machine, because my health is worth more than anything else. With my health, I can do pretty much anything. But without the health, I've got I've got nothing. Mm hmm. Yep, exactly, exactly. So so I guess the one other component and you, you kind of I guess we kind of talked a little bit about it with some of these other machines that may, you know, do some hydrogen rich water, but they don't do all that the Aquacure does. And uh, one thing that we've got um, that is incoming after it gets repaired is a, is a Rife machine. Um, so Rife frequencies. Um, this has a this has you I guess it's there's a setting on there for Hertz and you can, you know, choose the setting. And obviously in preparation for the Rife, Rife machine, I printed out like a 30 something page, um, you know, list of the frequencies for various so so-called diseases um could you speak to the frequency part of the aqua cure and, and, and what uh, you know what, what uh um, what that does how it works etc i'll start by saying i'm not a frequency for health expert but there are a lot of people who are and i get advice from them and they, they, they a lot of people have been experimenting with the frequencies in fact uh if you watch my uh, uh presentation at uh, gerald pollock's water conference in uh, uh in germany in 2019 October of 2019, you will see a guy stand up in the audience who had been working with the Browns gas, my AquaCure, and he said this, the uh, frequency that I normally set it at, which is 432, uh, which is a general health frequency, and um, he said it didn't really do it for him, uh, but he set it to 528, which uh, really worked for him. He noticed an immediate difference in uh, in his feeling about how the gas was, was working with him. So just like Every, everything else, every body is different. And so being able to optimize the, the uh, frequencies the, that are in the, in the uh, gas that's coming out, in the water that's in the gas that's coming out, the body can read those frequencies. Mm -hmm. I actually have read a lot of books on this particular subject uh, and uses those frequencies to, um, for health. Some of the things I've, like, I believe was Luc Montier actually sent frequencies from uh, from one laboratory to another laboratory where he had a flask with some uh, RNA molecules and stuff in it. And the frequencies being directed against that with a speaker caused those molecules to form into the same molecules as the frequencies that he had he had taken from another flask, he had recorded from another flask that had those, uh, those molecules in it. So the uh, it, it reformed the frequency, life, Life forms from these frequencies. It's it's astonishing, and mm -hmm. and and the information to do that was transmitted over a tel I'm going to say telephone line, internet, whatever the case may be. Right. It was it was yeah. an insanely important experiment that most people don't even know about. And but we can go into there's a lot of biofeedback and frequency uh, things. Rife, Rife was suppressed. He again he was a genius. Uh, he was able to uh, do things like explode parasites. He could find the resonant frequency of a bacteria or virus and actually cause it to fragment to, to pieces without damaging anything else. It's like the, the opera singer mm -hmm. that can that can reach a pitch and sustain it long enough to shatter a glass mm -hmm. because the uh, because the resonance was in there to to be able to do that. So it and and it accumulated the enough energy and it absorbed the energy to the point where it just blew apart. But the uh, so. The, the body itself, it, it's like everything around us is frequency. It's all energy in one way or another. Like Nikola Tesla was saying, everything is frequency. So the ability to change the frequency of the gas to uh, give a further optimization of the, the health uh, capabilities of the uh, Brown's gas with the AquaCure uh, was definite. I could do that technically. Uh, I'm a technician, was able to make that functionality but I'm not a, um, a frequency for health expert. I can't advise anyone on what specific frequency would work for them. But every body is different. And if you can learn what works for you, it's, it'll work. Yeah. I'm a big believer in uh, frequency for health and frequency medicine. And uh, I'm not so much of a technical expert, but I was a little curious how you, um, th the technological specifications of how you apply the frequencies to the gas or to the water and i had heard before that it was done through pulse width modulation but uh, could you explain a little bit more about that pulse width modulation is simply we, we take um and divide up 
let's say one second into a certain amount of uh, pulses. So we call each pulse 100%. So in this, in this pulse, uh, which is one frequency or one pulse, if you will, it, we're not talking hertz, we're talking pulses per second. But as you impress these pulses onto the uh, material, it's like you're being on a swing set. You're, you're pushing somebody on a swing set. Every time it, it comes up to where you are, you give it a push. You keep pushing, the person goes higher and higher, or you maintain it on the, on the swing set. So it's not uh, what's, what's in the Brown's gas isn't hertz. Uh, we don't put hertz in directly because hertz is a, a sine wave. It goes positive and negative. Electrolyzers only work on DC, which is direct current, which is, uh, it, it doesn't cycle back and forth like that. But we can pulse it. So each time we pulse it, it rings it like a bell. Like a, a clapper hits hits a, a bell one direction. It doesn't hit it, well, eventually it hits the other side. But the, my point is it hits it one direction and, or like you hit a tuning fork. You hit it one direction and then it, it vibrates. Okay. So this is what we're doing in the electrolyzer. We're hitting it with these pulses. The pulse width is how long the pulse is on or off. If you're 100% uh, pulse width, your, your, your pulses are on all the time. 1% mm -hmm. pulse of that, of that pulse, you're on only 1% of the time and 99% off. So 50% pulse, you're on 50% of the time, 50% off. So pulse width modulation just as varying the time that you're on and off each pulse, which is essentially telling how long that thing is hitting the uh, the, elect the, the uh, material in the electrolyte. Okay. I've noticed as you adjust the frequency on the machine, you can somewhat hear it with your ears. And so it does seem like it is converting into a sound wave of some sort. Am I, am I right. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess the water, the liquid crystal of the water is probably retaining that uh, the memory of that frequency. That's exactly right. Yep. Water right. retains Sounds good. absolutely insane amounts of energy. People have no idea. This this lowly little H2O molecule is the basis for all life, as far as I, I can see. Um, it the, the amount of energy, the, the amount of information that it can retain is insane. Uh, and we can get into uh, uh, what I call new water and the kind of things that can be done with that. Uh, at another time, I guess, because mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long we have to talk mm -hmm. about the health aspect. But um, uh, just to give a quick example, there was a, a study done where they took uh, at a slaughterhouse, they took cattle and divided it into three groups. They took uh, one group that was um, uh, uh, the control group, and it was just fed the water before it went into the slaughterhouse. The second group was fed water that was that came from the slaughterhouse. The third group of cattle was went through the slaughterhouse. They measured the uh, biometrics of, of all three uh, groups of cattle, and they discovered that the uh, stress of the cattle that, that were going through the, uh, the slaughterhouse that were getting killed and, and slaughtered, uh, obviously they were in a high stress uh, situation, but they took the water that, that uh, they used to wash everything down and, uh, and sterilized it every way, every way they could and they fed it to the second group of cattle. The second group of cattle start exhibiting all the stress factors that the group of cattle that went through the slaughterhouse did. The, their bodies could read the information that was in the water. And, and a similar thing when you're doing plants. People know that if you do acid rock to plants, they wither up and, and, uh, and don't do well. You give them something like Beethoven, they, they grow and flourish. If you, if you feed the plants water that was subjected to Beethoven so that it absorbed that, that frequencies, the, those plants who weren't even in the room do as well as the plants that actually are in the room with the music and vice versa, the mm -hmm. ones that uh, have the acid rock uh, wither uh, with that water. It's water, but it's been subjected to all these energies. Water absorbs life energies, sound, light. It's incredible the amount of energy that, uh, that water uh, absorbs. Yeah, absolutely. And so I can all obviously see, I guess, the importance of using distilled water that's kind of like uh, had a, a fresh memory and then applying the frequency to that uh, so that the water is, uh, is, I guess, more pure at that frequency because uh, the memory of the water has been, I guess, erased by the distilling. And then once it's been put through the machine, 
then it retains the, the memory of the frequency perhaps better or more cohesively. It, it would, but I would call distilled water purified more than erased. Uh, well, not erased. I meant like the memory aspect of it, yes. No, that's what I'm saying is the memory is not erased mm -hmm. by distillation, the, uh, uh, but it's purified. So a lot of the contaminants and stuff are taken away, and, and it does help uh, uh, reset some of the memory of the water, but water holds on to that information really tightly. If you were to uh, okay, take that okay. water and freeze it like Emoto was doing, you would see the crystal right. structures uh, form in the memory patterns of whatever it is that, that uh, was impressed into that water. So that's one of the reasons that all snowflakes are different because every water mo uh, molecule or droplet mm. has had a different life experience, if you will. So it has a different shape of the crystalline structure. So the, uh, what I was talking about before with new water is where you take hydrogen and oxygen, so they're not water. They're two different molecules, oh, and you burn them. It's a so new water the, molecule. Exactly. So now this water molecule is absolutely new, newly formed from hydrogen and oxygen. Uh -huh. the, the water is the exhaust of the, of the hydrogen oxygen flame, and that water starts absorbing information instantly. Whatever is in its mm -hmm. environment, that water starts absorbing that information. And if you, uh, if you then feed the plants this uh, new water that absorbs information that you want, uh, it, it will react. Anyway, the new water is, is programmable. It's, uh, now, you can impress other energies. It's like uh, in the old days when they had cassette tapes uh, or even, I guess, the, the new things with uh, thumb drives and stuff, computer things. You can impress a new memory over an old memory, and water can do that. Mm. So you can okay. reprogram water. But uh, the act of distillation doesn't erase its its uh, memory. It still has it. I was not aware of that. I had no idea that water held the memory so well, even in a vapor state. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So um, we have been going for, for a little while here, and I guess we're, we might not get uh, fully into, but we'll at least offer a few solutions um, in the in the realm of, uh, of, of I guess, uh, um, fuel fuel savings or maybe just uh, going around it altogether. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, George, the same technology. Um, can, I guess uh, um, I, I've, I've heard of, I know Stanley Meyer was working on a technology back in the 90s. I think it was um, a similar like on-demand hydrogen, Brown's gas sort of thing with, with cavitation. Um, I guess there, there are other, other potentialities too. Um, we had Scott Huddleston on to talk about it. He's working on, um, you know, um, I guess a small engine. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. I don't understand all of it yet. But anyway, there's a lot of possibilities out there. But um, I know you've got you've got an RV that, that you travel around in. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about uh, um, your setup and maybe some some ways that uh, um, Venu and Van Nomads could uh, you know save on their fuel costs or eliminate them all altogether? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, water as fuel is a dream that a lot of people have had, and some people have succeeded at. And every one of those people that I know of, I could, I could think of five fairly quickly, uh, have been suppressed. They, the information on exactly how they did it is not available to the public. That it was done, I am 100% convinced uh, that, that they could do it. And, and, uh, and some of the stories are quite dramatic. In, uh, in how these people were, were uh, suppressed, how, how they invented it, uh, some clues as to what they did. And I wrote a book called Water as Fuel, which people can buy off my .com website. And so the, and there's a lot of water as fuel technologies. The Hyzor, which is the uh, hydrogen for health, or sorry, hydrogen for fuel savings, excuse me, uh, was, uh, is, is in there as well. So um, yes. I would say that there, it is possible to use water as a fuel. I can only use water as a supplement. That, that's that's the, the limit of my particular technologies. But you can do water injection. You can do the, the uh, Brown's gas uh, electrolyzer on board. Uh, and, and between those two, you can generally get about a 25 to 50% increase in fuel mileage. So those are one of the technologies. I would also combine that with my vapor as fuel technologies, like the HICO 2A, uh, to get further gains. So first of all, gasoline or fossil fuels, diesel, gasoline, um, ship oil, whatever they, they're using, is, uh, is only burns in a vapor form. So if you can get it into a vapor form, either by evaporation or vaporization, uh, before the spark plug fires or before the compression stroke, then you're gonna go a lot further and more efficiently on the same amount of fuel. 
So that's the uh, that's the first thing. The uh, Brown's gas actually increases the efficiency, not by the hydrogen burning itself, but because the like if you're a water as fuel technology, that would be a different thing. And it's I, I have some ideas on how to do it, but I haven't been able to get back into that research. Um, so I, I'll leave that for just a second. <laughs> but what happens is the Brown's gas acts like a catalyst. Now, I, it is a catalyst, but I say like a catalyst in that a catalyst doesn't get consumed in the combustion, where because all the air fuel mixture is going through the, the engine, the uh, the Brown's gas goes through the engine as well. So it, it, it essentially gets consumed in the in the, in there. But what it does is you remember I was talking about those hydrogen carbon bonds and how much energy it takes to pull them apart. Mm -hmm. Well, in order for a flame to self propagate, in order for any uh, hydrocarbon fuel to burn, you got hydrogen carbons and they have to break apart all of those atomic bonds for complete combustion. It has to sever there and it takes a lot of energy to do that. The energy normally comes from the uh, uh, heat of combustion. So after you ignite the initial uh, fuel mixture, the uh, which incidentally cause, needs a tiny amount of water moisture to do. If you're totally dry gas, you actually can't. It's hard to burn uh, hydrocarbon fuel. So the uh, after that initial spark or or whatever it takes to break that apart, the uh, the heat of combustion breaks apart the rest of the uh, molecules, and so that's called endothermic energy. The energy into the the uh, chemical reaction to cause it to be ready to combust and then once it combusts it reforms into water and carbon dioxide and at that point you have excess energy exothermic energy so the less exothermic energy you have to use endothermically to put back into self-propagate the flame the more excess excess energy you have to drive the engine and internal combustion engines are heat engines so the more heat you can get from the fuel the further you can go on your gallon of gas so what's happening is you put in a little bit of Brown's gas and it increases the efficiency of combustion because the Brown's gas helps break apart those molecules, helps the combustion break apart those uh, hydrogens and carbons, uh, atoms away. From, so you, you're taking, breaking down those molecules into the constituent atoms so they can reform into carbon dioxide and water with less energy, a lot less energy. So you end up using less of your heat energy to self-propagate the flame. You have excess heat energy for expanding gases that drives the piston um, and and creates the, the, uh, the, the pressures that, that are necessary. And then a person can get into, like with the Bork engine, the Bork engine is uh, an engine that's designed that works very well on detonation. So the, the uh, faster you can detonate the fuel, the more power you're going to get out of a Bork engine. The normal internal combustion engine has a, a crankshaft uh, this design more for uh, a slower combustion and it has and and because of the way it goes in reciprocating cycle engines your, your piston actually stops at top dead center and stops at bottom dead center and then it accelerates on its way up and then slows down and stops and then on its way down again it accelerates it slows down and stops at the bottom so during that just past top dead center if you can build the pressure then you're going to get your maximum amount of uh, pressure converted to, or heat converted into pressure uh, to push on that piston. After the piston is already moving down and accelerating, any any uh, pressure that you're developing is going to be less and less effective as the piston moves away from the head. So these uh, that's why the Brown's gas essentially helps. Now there's various reasons why the water helps. Again, you need some water in order for the fossil fuels to even uh, combust, but Another thing that happens in internal combustion engines is if you have excess fuel, which most of them have these days because they're not running on vapor fuel, they're running on a, a mixture of vapor and liquid. So you have two combustions. The first combustion is where you get your actual power, but then the heat of combustion vaporizes the rest of the fuel that was in liquid. That fuel mixes with air, oxygen, and then starts combustion. So that's the second combustion. But that happens up to 25 milliseconds after the first combustion. So, and you only have about seven, seven and a half milliseconds at 2000 RPM uh, for your most complete uh, uh, push on the piston. Anything after that, it's, it's combusting uh, right out the exhaust. Your exhaust valve opens in about 25 milliseconds. So you, 
you have the second combustion burning right out past your, your exhaust valves, and that's what burns up the exhaust valves. And you know what they do to fix that? They add extra fuel, extra liquid fuel. Oh, so yeah. the first combustion that drives your engine uh, makes the heat and pressure that, that vaporizes the rest of the fuel, which vaporizes so much fuel that it brings it over the combustion uh, limit. Uh, um, it makes it too rich to burn. So now it quenches the flame with excess fuel, okay? Now going out to your exhaust valve, you have a nice cool mixture, relatively speaking. It's not burn, <laughs> hot enough to burn the valves, but it's full of hydrocarbons. <laughs> You're, and so what they do is they put a catalytic converter in the exhaust system to burn all this fuel that you didn't burn in the engine. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's very it makes a lot of sense, thing. right? If you sell, if you want to sell a lot of fuel, so if you uh, your nomads out there, if they uh, go with the vapor fuel systems for virtually all com internal combustion engines, you're going to go up to ten times further on your gallon of gas, at least double, even if you're using the Hyco 2A systems. And I have a book called uh, Extreme Mileage 101, uh, which uh, all these are available in PDF form as, uh, format as well. So your nomads don't have to have a lot of books uh, <laughs> stored under the seat in order to uh, do it. You can look at them on the computer screen. And the um, so, I, like I say, I have an RV myself. Okay. So in the RV that I have myself, I, I'm embarrassed to say I do not have all my fuel savers on it, even though I've owned this thing for over 10 years. I... Uh, I've just been too busy. I'm sorry to say. First of all, it was my late wife and and uh, and taking care of her, and now and now it's this aquacure business, and I I'm actually hiring mechanics to do my mechanical work for me instead of doing it myself. It's it's insane. But I did, as I was going back and forth across the country, uh, hook up a uh, Hyco 2A system as a total vapor carburation system for my RV uh, generator, four kilowatt uh, Onan generator. So it could run entirely on vapor fuel. So I could run my generator for days uh, longer than I could if I if I didn't have this vapor fuel system on it. And I do have the uh, schematics and plans and stuff so that people could do that themselves if they would like to. So but so what I did is I had this thing on my generator anyway. So what I did is I, I hooked up that Hyco 2A system to my V10, 6.8 liter V10. It's in a uh, Ford chassis uh, uh, under the... Um, um, RV, uh, Class C, 27 foot. So I was, uh, it cost me approximately $1,400. I was getting about seven and a half miles to the gallon when I first got it. Uh, it cost me about $1,400 to go from the West Coast to the East Coast of America. And uh, at the time I was uh, traveling because I had uh, family, we go to weddings and things like that. I was living in the West. Now I live in the East. So we essentially moved so we wouldn't have to keep traveling back and forth across the country so, so many family events and, and such. So mm -hmm. um, what I did is I hooked up the uh, vapor system that was on the uh, generator because I wasn't running my generator when I was going down the road uh, in so it was giving some vapor fuel to the, uh, at the, the V10 and I doubled my mileage in that case. I was getting somewhere around 13 to 14 miles to the gallon and it cost me only $750 to go across the country than 1400 and that becomes really important in these days where they're where they're accusing uh, 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 this Russian thing Ukraine Russian thing of raising the price of fuel which is totally bogus by the way but but they're but they're using it as an excuse anyway to make a whole bunch more money the, the United States really wasn't bringing much of its fuel from Russia they were getting it mostly from Canada <laughs> and Biden shut that down as soon as he got into office so the uh, and, and also a lot of the uh, uh, drilling and the um, um, fracking and all the United States at the time that Biden came into the office was an oil exporting nation. And they shut all that off. <laughs> what the heck? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lordy, Lordy. And I'm not saying I, I necessarily promote using fossil fuels, but I'm saying we are using fossil fuels. So we might as well use them efficiently. Yeah, and the exactly. technologies that, that I have can can reduce if they were applied even at a rate of a manufacturer cost of about three hundred dollars per vehicle it would double the uh, fuel economy of the entire fleet just just with the technology that i have which i know they know the hyco 2a for example is a technology i developed independently 
But when I went to the research, uh, to the uh, patent offices and started to do my research, I found 5,000 fuel saver patents in three days. Okay, 5,000. Not one of which is on the market, is on the market. Not one. Okay. So the patent system actually is a way that they use to help suppress fuel savers because they can, yeah, they have the trap. service where people can subscribe. Yes, exactly. I don't patent my fuel savers. I write a book and teach people how to do it. Okay. And, and that's how I make my money. Not, not with the, uh... so in any case, and I make kits to sell, but right now all my kits are out. I apologize to the listeners. I, I'd like to, but I, I'm totally involved in this AquaCure thing, so all my kit, uh, kits aren't. But if you write to me, I will refer you to people that I trust that are making fuel savers that you can uh, put on your vehicles, and we'll go from there. Okay, so Sounds the like uh, mm-hmm. yeah, well, I'm I'm all about helping people. I'm and it's and it's working really well. So the uh, my own uh, vehicles, uh, my other is a Kia Niro that that I, I'm driving. So it's a hybrid electric, and I I in the summertime I go through maybe one tank of fuel, but I yeah. I've got a, a a 24 kilowatt solar panel system on my house, so I I pretty much have all my fuel for free from the sun, and it's it's good. Yeah, but I guess I've heard you talk a little bit about um, on on other podcasts. That's a uh, um, that's a uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I guess you you did have some government agencies coming to 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 validate the uh, authenticity to make sure you weren't making making claims about your your fuel savers. So you had some interactions with the coercers yourself. Oh, good lord! I was investigated by various government agencies seven times. Yeah, it was not fun, but. I cooperated fully, and they were able to confirm that I was doing no fraud. I, I, they gave me a letter in this one particular case from the uh, state of the uh, Idaho State Attorney General. Uh, sent a letter saying, "We're not endorsing your product, but we are acknowledging that you're not cheating or frauding anyone." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because even so though no I had fraud, seven government but... investigations of my business, there was not one customer complaint. In fact, I, I had a guy from uh, Seattle uh, come up to me one time when I was in an event there, and he said, I bought your carburetor enhancer with the specific intent of suing you because I was going to put it on my vehicle, it was not going to work, and I was going to sue you. That's how I was going to make my money. He says, but it worked. Can I be a distributor? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, well, so, so, so the so so there there are options out there, and as far as like uh, the technical, um, like the technical knowledge, know how to to put these systems in, and to I know that you've got after you put in the vapor system, you've got to reduce the amount of fuel going in. So there's some I guess some tuning that needs to be done. Um, how hard is all this to do um, for someone who say just someone who doesn't really have who might be able to change the oil on a vehicle, and that's it, like basic maintenance. Yes, uh, you really should have some do-it-yourself mechanical skills, backyard mechanic. Uh, when I grew up, well, on the ranch, obviously, we did everything. But when I grew up in the era that I did, most people worked on their own vehicles. Then the computers started to come in and, and less and less people work on their vehicles. But you, you really do need to know, uh, have some basic mechanical skills to apply these things yourself. You can hire mechanics. There are some mechanics that are interested in applying these sort of things to put them on the vehicles, and my books explain it fully. I, I've even had, uh, in, in Ontario, Canada, they, they call it Class A mechanic. Um, the Class A mechanic say, I learned more from your book than I did in, in all my mechanic schooling. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. good. And yeah. even when I went to my college mechanics courses, uh, I, was, I ended up being the teacher's assistant. It was a self-paced course, and I went through it three times faster than any of the other students. Uh, because I'd already had a lot of experience, and I ended up uh, uh, increasing the fuel mileage of the instructor's vehicles and such, <laughs> even as I was taking the course. Yeah, it was it was fun. So yes, uh, the amount of skill needed. You, you you do need to know how to use the general tools that if a person had a garage, like I'm I'm not talking a, a mechanics garage. I'm talking if you have a home like workshop or something, you probably have enough skills to do it. There are some that. Uh, somebody knows how to install a radio in a vehicle, which again, I'm now dating myself because radios, people don't install radios anymore. They, they, the vehicles come with custom radios in them. 
Good Lord, things keep changing. So in any case, um, changing a light switch, that sort of thing. If you if you can generally do things, you can understand it enough that you could, uh, if nothing else, find a friend or, or something that can install these things. Most of them, I, t I built everything to be able to do at home. There's using no tools that aren't normally in a home uh, workshop. So there's no, uh, no, no problem there. It's only just knowing how to use the tools and how to apply it to a vehicle. So the amount of materials and space and, and skills that you need, uh, do-it-yourself mechanic, no problem. Any mechanic, no problem. Even an apprentice mechanic would know how to put these things on. Awesome. And I guess a similar question, because um, with, with Vonnie, it's all about self-liberation, you know, um, what, you know, I guess uh, um, becoming more liberated is, you know, taking control of your life in all the, in various areas. So I guess in, re in regards to the AquaCure too, um, I, I, you, uh, you, uh, you're trying to get people to, to make those. And I think I saw even a book on, on those too, or maybe a, a, an assembly kit or something like that, that you might have offered at some time. But how, how complicated would the AquaCures be to, to build one um, someone's going to do it themselves? Yes. Again, you've got your uh, back to your do it yourself thing. And there's like I was building my first aqua cures in my RV. So you don't need a lot of space to uh, to, to get this thing started. Uh, now, I was doing that because my workshop that I built onto the side of my house uh, was well, it was a big hole in the ground at that particular time. So the uh, I, I didn't have any space to work. So I things I needed to expand. I went into the kitchen, which my wife was very adamant that as soon as I was done, it went back into the RV. <laughs> Oh man, she's she's something. So, the uh, you don't need a lot of space. You do need the tools. Uh, the course that I'm I'm uh, going to have will list all the tools that you need. Uh, it's all just normal or normal uh, workshop tools that a that a person can do in their own home or in a, uh, uh, a one car garage kind of thing. I the more space you have, the bigger you can do something. But a normal sized uh, 900 square foot home with a garage on it would would have all the facilities necessary. Uh, like I said, I was doing it in a 27 foot RV when I was initially doing. I could build about one a day in the RV, but then I was I was uh, hauling down uh, totes, uh, storage totes, and and some of them would go outside the RV in the snowbank while I was uh, sorting things around to get to the next step. So then I'd do this step, and then I'd sort everything around again to do the next step. But it's possible to do it. Uh, with uh, just regular basic skills and uh, and and getting yourself a space, you are going to have enough money. Going to have to have enough money, and uh, to buy the parts and everything, as well as uh, take the course. So there there are some requirements, and that'll all be spelled out before anyone spends any money. So they got their full understanding of what they're getting into. Awesome. Awesome. That's uh, that's that's incredible. So I guess just uh, we had a, one question that was sent in from uh, from uh, from a listener, and um, we've already covered the first half of it, which is great. Um, but the second one, I, I keep hearing more and more about it. Um, so uh, and, and about the importance of it. Um, but uh, uh, deuterium depleted water. Um, I guess uh, um, what uh, I guess uh, is the water that comes from the aquacure. Um, is that deuterium depleted water? I guess are there any specific protocols or anything you could speak to in that regard? Okay, um, that actually goes back again to the new water thing. First of all, there is no water that comes from the uh, aquacure. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a mixture of gases that are made from water. So you're putting water into the aquacure and you're getting hydrogen and oxygen and electrically expanded water out, not water, or at least not very much, maybe a little water moisture. So when you bubble that gas into water, it doesn't do anything to the deuterium. Whatever deuterium is in the water, doesn't get depleted or addition. It doesn't add any deuterium. It doesn't take any deuterium away. It doesn't neutralize any deuterium. So if you're drinking water that has deuterium in it, you're drinking the same. It doesn't matter one way or the other. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and we're making an attachment for the AquaCure to do this specific thing, if you're making the new water, the new water does not have deuterium in it. It's just H2O. There's, there's no heavy water. Mm. So you can make deuterium depleted water with the aquacure. It doesn't, there, there isn't deuterium depleted water coming out, it's only the gases. But when you burn those gases and the new water that's formed, that is deuterium depleted water. So that's one of the advantages of the aquacure itself is it is specifically designed to be able to do that. All the thousands of aquacures that we have sold in the last four years, 
uh, are designed to accept this particular th attachment that we are developing, and uh, and and it and it'll just retrofit right onto it. Whereas a lot of the other technologies that are out there, that that less expensive machines, they hate it when I call it cheaper. <laughs> The less expensive machines out there don't have the functionality to be able to safely and properly support uh, a flame. So the uh, that and you need to have the flame in order to, or at least have the combustion in one way or another, in order to make the deuterium depleted water. Yeah. Gotcha. So so that'll be an, an add-on then um, for the for the aqua care at some point. Um, and I guess the just uh, um, I, I can give I can give right. a real brief overview. It's it's basically talking about the heaviness or lightness of your water. The heaviness, like uh, if you drink, you know. Um, well water with lots of minerals or something those could build up in your tissues and in, in, in your cells it's kind of the way that I understand it is that is that kind of accurate um, a deuterium is actually water it's still water that has extra uh, now I, I can't specifically remember if it's uh, neutrons or protons but it but it actually has neutrons. Uh, it's neutrons okay it actually has extra neutrons thank you uh, and and therefore it and, and they actually used electrolysis to uh, to make heavy water back in the day of the atom bombs, and and they were needing the heavy water to and the nuclear reactors to uh, dampen the nuclear reaction, and that and it does the same thing in your body. This is the reason why you need the uh, you, you do need some DDW deuterium in your body in order to prevent things from going wild, but if you have too much, it dampens everything. So this is, it does exactly the same thing in your body as it did with the nuclear reactions. So you want to have a balance. And a lot of people have too much deuterium in their bodies now. So if you can drink water that is deuterium deficient, in other words, it doesn't have very much in it, then your body gets, does get rid of deuterium on a constant, uh, a continuous basis. But if, you, if you're ingesting more than, than it's going out, then you end up with too much uh, in your body. So it isn't the minerals or, or, or uh, the other contaminants that may be in water. Uh, that's accumulating. That's the calcium. All those sort of things are separate. It's a different issue. Okay. What we're talking is those extra neutrons in the water, uh, and we're wanting to get those out, uh, or find the balance in the body that that is the most healthful. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, all right. Well, uh, um, I don't have any other questions. We've kept you for a long time. I know you've got a lot going on. I don't want to keep don't want to keep you too much longer. Bueller, do you have any other questions or anything else you want to bring up before uh, we begin to close out here? Um. I don't have any other questions, especially related to the health and wellness aspect, which we seem to have covered pretty well. And uh, I guess when it comes to Brown's gas technology, uh, George is making the AquaCure more available, and I highly encourage everyone to at least give it a try. Um, I have had, like, like I said, within the first five minutes, I had a noticeable effect. So I highly encourage everyone to, to try this out for, for any ailments, great or small, and uh, see, see how it works for you. There's three things I'd like to mention uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. Please do. First of all, it's nomads that we're talking to. And the Browns gas, uh, the, the AquaCure can be run in an RV while you're running the RV with, the, with an inverter. It runs on an inverter quite nicely. And in fact, when I'm driving long distances, I actually like to have the cannulas on so that because it's, mm. it, it keeps me alert without even mm -hmm. drinking coffee or anything. So I'm running the machine as I'm driving down the road, which I'm, I'm just waiting for a cop to pull me over someday for some reason and see me with cannulas on in my nose. It's just I'm just waiting for that. So anyway, travel, no problem. Second of all, there's a lifetime warranty on the machines, a manufacturer's warranty. So in addition to the one year satisfaction guarantee, if anything goes wrong, that is that is a cause is our fault that that, that the, it, it broke. We will fix it. We'll pay for the shipping, the labor, the parts, everything to get it back. So the money you spend up front should be the last money that you spend on these machines to have decades of use out of the machine. And getting away from the AquaCure and back to the fuel savers a little bit, there's something I call SEAT technology, Combustion Enhancement Interface Technology, which is really important these days. Just like the carburetor enhancer was the thing that I developed it, it turned out to be a fuel saver in and of itself, but it was the interface technology between the carburetor and the fuel saver, the, uh, the vapor system that I was working on, the Heiko 2A. So the, uh, but you don't want to actually get rid of the fuel system that's on your vehicle right now. So you need some way of uh, convincing the fuel system 
or making it play nice with your fuel saver. And that's what we call the uh, see it technology, like the uh, eFi device, and the which you'll see on the website, which is uh, electronic fuel enhancer or the map sensor enhancers, which you can buy a lot of those on eBay or to these places that I'll uh, uh, recommend you to, because the sensors on the vehicles uh, tell the computer what's going on. And just like our eyes and ears, uh, the computer only knows what it sees and hears from these sensors. And if the sensors are, are telling it something that it doesn't like, then it, it changes to try to get it back to what it does like. And let's give an example of the oxygen sensor. So if you're using less fuel to get the same amount of power, you've increased your combustion efficiency, you're going to have more oxygen in the exhaust. Well, more oxygen in the exhaust, the computer says, oh, my goodness, there's more oxygen in the – and so it adds fuel to the, for the injectors to get that oxygen level back down again. So you aren't saving any fuel. But if you can mm. modify the signal coming from the oxygen sensor so that the computer does not know that there's extra oxygen in the exhaust, everything is still operating normally. A signal is being sent. But on the way to the computer, you modify that signal, and it's adjustable so you can modify it however which way you want. So, and interestingly enough, a lot of motorcyclers these days are using it to increase the power of their motorcycles. They just adjust it the other way, so it gives more fuel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a, mm. but you can go either way. All right. So you can you can lean the fuel uh, you can lean the fuel mixture simply by adjusting it so that the the computer thinks that there's more fuel than or, or even less oxygen than there actually is. So then the uh, computer actually. Uh, leans the fuel mixture thinking that it's too rich and so that it's important to in addition to the fuel saver to study the fuel savers it's important to study the interface technology what sensors you have to adjust to make the fuel saver play nice with your engine I just wanted to mention that as well sure fantastic and that is uh, that is very very important um, to know especially with the these newer newer vehicles out there um, but uh, um, but yeah, this this has been incredible. I've said on this podcast before, like there there aren't really any uh, you know like magic you know magic pill solutions to health or wellness or anything. It's really like like stop chronically poisoning yourself with you know modern modern nonsense and uh, fixed efficiencies. And that, but the but the other the the one I guess the one the one caveat the one exception I'll make is that um, is is breathing number one. Um, breathing is huge. A lot of people breathe wrong nowadays. Um, and uh, the other thing is water. I never realized the importance of water, structured water. Um, these sorts of things. Um, so as far as like, like if there are any such, you know, magic solutions to health, it's literally stuff that's just as basic as, as, as basic as that, as, as I've as I've kind of found out in in, in mine. And and, of, and it's interesting enough that this device combines both of them. Um, you know, breathing the Browns gas water and drinking it too. So um, I don't know. I'm I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of potential, and especially like with with these. Um, with these so-called diseases of civilization, I think it, it can solve, it can, it can get to a lot of root causes. Um, and uh, yeah, put the body back into regeneration mode, which um, again, like I, I try to emphasize, like even without any conscious effort whatsoever, the body's going through millions upon millions of reactions to keep you alive every single day and you don't have to think about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible what it can do if you just, you know, give it what it needs. So um, with that, George, I'll, I, I appreciate you coming on. Any, cl any other closing thoughts before I, before I let you go? Uh, we might mention again the uh, uh, discount. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Of course. Um, yeah, so the uh, discount code is VANU uh, if you want to pick up uh, your own Aqua Cure. Um, and uh, I will put a link in the show notes uh, to pick that up. But it's eagle-research.net um, is the website, I believe, for the, for the Aqua Cure. And, um, yeah, all uh, – any, any... – Not .net. Oh, .net. It's, okay. It's .life. .life. Okay. Okay. So eagle-research.life or .com. But .life is a website I set up side – specifically for the health aspects of uh, Brown's gas. And, and so you don't have to go into my .com website where there's thousands of pages about all different kinds of inventions and try to ferret out the information that you want. So if you're for health, you, you go over to the .eagle-research.life website. Sorry, interrupting. I, I just wanted to oh, clarify. No problem. I, 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 appreciate the, I appreciate the clarification. So yeah, you can save 500 bucks. Just keep on code VANU. And uh, any commissions earned from that will go to the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness. I'm not sure what that's going to be in be next. I mean, we've talked about ozone generators and, um, or maybe just an Aquacure fund for new Pazians that come on. Because I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, it's, it's. Uh, I think it's that important where we might just you know start a fund so people join the network. We uh, you know help them buy an Aquacure for for the various Pazians. I don't know. Maybe we'll do that. Um, it's all still up in the air, but it will go to the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness and, and to uh, you know to to help uh, um, to help folks. So 
Um, anyway, George, thanks so much uh, again for coming on. It's been an honor um, to chat, and uh, I wish you the the best of uh, you know. The, the, the machines are going. You're you're doing you're doing uh, really really incredible work uh, getting it out there. Um, so um, I would say best of luck, but it sounds like you're already doing it. Um, so yeah, yeah. hope hope it keeps <laughs> going well for you. Yeah, it's it's pretty insane how well it is going. In that, I believe uh, I'm I'm a spiritual person. I believe I was given this uh, uh, task. Uh, I I didn't do it at first when I was told to. I, that's a Jonah story, if you will. And I paid the price, heavy price, but that price also gives me the uh, passion that I need to uh, to help as many people as possible. So I'm here to help, and I appreciate being on your platform. Very grateful. Thank you. Hey, cheers, George. Thank you, George. Thank you. So, um, all right, guys, and there you have it, George Wiseman. Um, the inventor of the AquaCure, um, just truly, truly incredible device. Again, use coupon code VANU. Um, I'll put the, the link in the show notes to pick it up. Um, but uh, um, yeah, would definitely recommend you. Definitely recommend it. Um, definitely recommend it. Um, it's it's built to last. And uh, you know, well, you may sp may spend a little more, uh, you know, initial on investment costs versus some of the other ones. They don't do what this machine does. Um, they don't do it. So. Um, I, I, I'm you know, more than happy to invest my money talking about you. Maybe if, if I could get my parents to use it, um, I, I did bring it up to my dad. Um, just, just as I, a kind of litmus test to see how far out some of my ideas are, um, just to see what their reactions are. I told them I was inhaling Brown's gas water or, you know, Brown's gas. And yeah, it was obviously it doesn't really, like, doesn't really meet with the normal, normal things. But anyway, um, I think they're important to get in every house as, as you're trying to. So, um, anyway, guys, uh, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Vonnie podcast. Uh, until next time, always remember, Bonnie was yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. <laughs>